Our final speaker before uh, lunch, which is a terrible burden to place on anybody, is Chris Toomey of um, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, who will be talking about security for a rising China crossing the river by feeling for the stones. Chris. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to, to you and, and to Paul for involving me in this. I went to high school uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, born and raised in, in San Francisco and Oakland. I went to Bishop O'Dowd and um, really pleased to, to be a part of uh, this program. I think it's important in general, but particularly nice to, to do so in, in a place I consider home. Um, uh, so let me kind of talk about a couple of broad themes, and then we'll delve down into uh, a, a series of kind of contentious uh, issue areas that we can come back to in, in Q and A. Um, I want to. I'm very happy. Uh, you know, Barry was was uh, my first pro professor as I transitioned out of the economics field into political science, and he was kind of the gateway drug to get me into into China. Um, uh, and it's wonderful to kind of be in his classroom again, 25, 30 years later, uh, and be reminded of of what I found so appealing. Um, but also substantively, I want to really build on those points. I think the narrative that we have in the United States about China on the security side really focuses on an expectation of continued rise um, based on economics, but, but then carried into the security realm uh, and the challenges that that poses. And so I want to you know, start from that, that point that, that Barry led us to of expecting a decline in that growth rate and so that the challenges that we might be imagining, I think, are a little bit overstated. Um, a couple of the other factors that I think also dominate our discussions are, are uh, you know, this, this sense that, uh, the, the second point there, that, that China, which doesn't show up at all in the color, uh, that, that there's a Thucydides trap um, that we have to worry about with China. Uh, that is, that a rising power inevitably will want to uh, take over from the established uh, power. And for those of you doing world history, you can, you can kind of draw on that. Um, uh, the hot link should show up in the CD that you're going to get uh, for, to an article by Graham Allison, who looked at a series of um, uh, such power transitions, as we would talk about in the international relations uh, literature, uh, between an established ruling hegemon and uh, a rising, uh, what they would call challenger in the field, um, uh, most of which ended up in uh, something like a large systemic uh, war. Uh, and so I think one of the questions is, you know, to what extent is that an accurate um, uh, representation of the contemporary U.S.-China geostrategic situation? And if part of the answer is, well, wait a minute, um, Professor Naughton just told us that that rise isn't going to quite occur uh, in the same way that we're expecting it to on the basis of the last 30 years of history. Well, then, then you're put in a rather different geostrategic context that doesn't uh, emphasize uh, or doesn't, doesn't lead inevitably to that uh, negative outcome. The other aspect, though, is um, both sides are very aware of this history. Uh, President Obama has used the, the term Thucydides trap and, and a need to avoid it. Um, so too the, the Chinese have their own uh, phraseology, the new type of great power relations or major power relations, um, which is intended to uh, avoid those sorts of, of conflicts very explicitly. Now, there's other aspects in that foreign policy rhetoric um, that, that involve uh, U.S. tolerance of uh, Chinese uh, policy preferences in, in certain areas that we can kind of come back to that are a little bit more problematic. But I think at least it shows that the leadership um, is aware of this historic tendency and wants to do something about it. And I think that's uh, important to, to, to recognize. So that's a great little article. It's a short Atlantic monthly piece um, uh, that, that is easily accessible for students. It kind of brings in a bunch of different history. Um, another kind of uh, trope to use, uh, I think, Tom's, uh, or maybe it was Jeff, uh, uh, you know, way of talking about um, U.S.-China relations is, uh, uh, and, and Jeff certainly mentioned the, the Jacquez uh, book, um, uh, When China Rules the World. Uh, if it, when I'm speaking to a Washington audience or to, to my uh, students uh, who are all military officers, uh, they're more familiar with the Michael Pillsbury 100-year uh, marathon book. Again, that both of those kind of suggest China has a long-term plan and intent to rule the region, the world, to take over. Uh, from the United States. And 
you know, I, I think that's uh, a, a mischaracterization of the way uh, China uh, operates. And I think you kind of captured that a little bit in, in uh, all three of the previous, uh, uh, all four of the previous speakers, um, that there isn't that degree of kind of continuity uh, in long-term Chinese thinking about where they want the country to be. There are certainly historic antecedents that shape the way China views. There is a, a party line that, that is uh, 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 promulgated throughout the media, throughout the educational system. Um, but mostly, uh, there is a, a sense in, in Chinese economic reforms that the, the reforms were, you cross, you learned this, I'm sure, from Barry's class or maybe from Tom Bernstein, that you cross the river um, by looking for the next stone to step across. You don't know exactly what, how you're going to get across the river. You're just looking to take the next step you can to keep your feet dry. Um, and so that's a very short-term oriented uh, approach. And I think when we think about uh, Chinese foreign policy, I think that's the accurate way of uh, characterizing it, that there are a lot of local Chinese interests that China would like to advance, but in terms of a long-term, uh, whether it's a 100-year plan for, for Mike Pillsbury from uh, 1949 to, to 2049 or uh, some other uh, long-term, I, you know, I think that's not necessarily correct. And, and most what, what China has are, are interests that we can understand from a geostrategic perspective, um, but they're mostly local. Like most countries, other than the United States, China has a lot of security concerns that are local, not global. The U.S. is uh, fairly unique in characterizing uh, its interests uh, in global terms. Um, so I'm fairly optimistic um, because I think uh, you know, all of those different points uh, need to be kind of put in context. I'm fairly optimistic about Sino-American uh, relations going forward. Nevertheless, and I'm happy to talk uh, and will in a second about some of the action-reaction cycles where you get into unintended, uh, not inevitable uh, sorts of uh, conflicts. Um, so you know, some of these specific areas, uh, you know, how should we think about Chinese um, foreign policy, Chinese security policy in the South China Sea, which has been in the headlines because of the uh, recent tribunal's uh, decision, but also in the East China Sea, uh, the Senkakus and, and Diaoyus were, were mentioned uh, uh, earlier. Um, and I think the, the phrase that resonates for me, uh, coming out of one of the recent think tank uh, reports, is reactive assertiveness. China takes advantage of an opportunity to react to somebody else. In 2009, under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, you had to make your continental shelf declarations, so a variety of Southeast Asian nations did so, and that begins a spiral of tensions in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, China is certainly uh, a, a very strong uh, participant in that because it's the largest uh, player in, in many different dimensions, um, but, but it's not solely their fault. There were other um, instances of provocation. Similarly, in the East China Sea, um, uh, you know, the, the U.S. policy on, on the Senkaku Islands uh, is, is fairly nuanced, but uh, there is a uh, sense of, of only focusing on the Chinese uh, escalations in that context, and I think that's uh, not fair. The Japanese, too, have done things that have complicated that situation through the nationalization of the islands. I think there are other ways they could have handled that um, uh, going back. Um, another set of concerns focuses, uh, and again, this, this came out nicely of really all, all four of the previous presentations, on the role of, of Chinese nationalism. Um, in a way that is driving security concerns, constraining the, the leadership's ability to make compromises on things like the South China Sea, on things like uh, Taiwan, uh, and that this has really become central to uh, the, the leadership's legitimacy, uh, as, as Victor and others have, have talked about, um, but that it really complicates the ability to manage crises when there are inherent conflicts of, of interest over sovereignty. Um, you know, one other trend to talk about is, is kind of the PLA's ability to address, uh, to secure each of these interests. And, and maybe I'll kind of turn to the budgets uh, for the military as, as one useful way of, of kind of talking about that. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for an indicator of what a country's degree of security concern or, or uh, intentions are, I think military budgets are a pretty darn good place to start. It is the guns and butter trade-off, right? How much are you willing to pour into uh, the, the purchase of guns when you have these major concerns about economic growth rates at home um, complicating your ability to put butter into people's uh, larders? All right, now let's see if this works. It doesn't. Can we hit the button? Um, 
you can give it a click on the graphic and we might get a nice smooth fancy animation here. Oh, go back one and, uh, and then move the mouse and see if that little play button down on the bottom, too fancy for my own good. It's gonna show, it would show um, <laughs> dramatic growth, exponential growth in Chinese military spending over time. Um, that, that uh, you know, really causes my, st my students um, significant angst. Uh, that when you've got Chinese uh, economic growth for a 30-year period at about 10%, the military growth has stayed at that same level. In a time when, you know, the United States, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's been a long time since our military has grown at a 10% per year rate. Um, so that leads to very significant problems. But let's put this in context a little bit. You know, one of the important uh, points is the Chinese economy has also grown that fast. And so it isn't that security issues are playing a greater uh, uh, role in Chinese expressed, in, you know, preferences. Um, China's kept about the same amount of uh, GDP spent on military uh, expenditures uh, constant over, over a fairly long period of time here. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, another way of kind of putting that in context would be to compare the Chinese military spending to that of the United States, right? Um, now these, tr you know, and, and so first of all, uh, we're, we're way up there. You can see the bump for the, the last two wars that, that are winding down. Um, but, but more generally, I think it's also, you don't want to extrapolate these trend lines in your head. We're using weapons today that we used, that we built in the 1960s, that we built before I was born, B-52s, right? Um, we have a, a, a repository of human capital and physical capital in the military that comes about from the summation of all these past years. So rather than thinking about the snapshot of one year's worth of military spending, you want to think about the area under each one of those graphs, at least going back 10, 20 years. Um, you know, certainly my students have all, they're kind of mid-level officers, they've all been in the service for 10 years. The investment that we've made in them um, through training and, and certainly experience in the conflicts uh, gives us a lot more capability. So this is a very different picture then about the rise of China, that, you know, China that's about to pass the United States, that has passed the United States in PPP terms uh, in the overall economy. This is a much weaker military uh, in general. Um, than, than the United States uh, has. Now, let me just flag a couple of other issues on, um, uh, on military expenditures. You will often see purchasing power parity um, uh, comparisons made for the United States and Chinese economies, which makes some sense. It's an adjustment to recognize that market exchange rates or uh, uh, if not fully market-driven exchange rates, the exchange rates that are, that are determined by the uh, two respective governments, don't adequately capture the, the cost of living. And so when I go to China and I get a per diem from, from the government, boy, I live like a king uh, over there, right? And, and even if you're not on a per diem from government, you can eat very inexpensively, uh, at least outside of the hotels in, in, uh, in Beijing. Um, and so you want to make some adjustment to that if you're trying to measure quality of life sorts of issues. But that's not the best uh, exchange rate to use for uh, uh, assessing military expenditures because a lot of military expenditures are not food. It is capital intensive uh, weaponry uh, or uh, you know things that are bought on the international market like international weapons bought from, from Russia for which market exchange rates ought to be uh, uh, used. So you will often see what I consider to be very threat hyping statements about Chinese military expenditure relative to the United States that don't take into consideration um, these sorts of factors that use PPP instead that negate the, the value of uh, U.S. investments over, over a long period of time. One of the other things that's happened uh, in the last, say, five years, um, I guess last three years, is we've, we've be, uh, the Chinese have now announced what their domestic security budget is. And again, if you're thinking about what are the driving concerns in the security realm, um, knowing as we now do that China spends more on its domestic security, these are suppression forces. These are, these are not happy um, uh, sides of the Chinese economy or, or the vibrant political sphere that, that does exist uh, that, that we've heard a little bit about and you'll hear more about uh, going forward in these presentations. Um, this is the, the, the kind of repressive human rights violating 
uh, sets of uh, uh, personnel, but that's a bigger expenditure than the military that would be oriented outward. Uh, and the Chinese have announced that going back two, white, two defense white papers ago. Um, so I think that gives you a little sense of where the leadership thinks their primary concerns are coming from, right? They have significant concerns uh, in addressing uh, these sorts of, uh, of issues uh, that, that, we've, that, that uh, have been flagged earlier. Okay, that's the positive side. And I, and I you know, if, if I ran out of time here, it would be okay with me, because um, I'd like to leave you with that. But, but let me kind of also flag um, you know, that there is, nevertheless, you've got uh, that first non-animated slide that, that showed, uh, that would have showed 10% growth per year in um, uh, actual military spending, and that has allowed China to develop a lot of weapons. Uh, here's one chart that shows uh, the, the range of different missile systems that the Chinese um, have at their fingertips now. Uh, and this is a, worth, a, a worthwhile thing to highlight. It's something that the U.S. doesn't have a lot of capabilities in for a variety of reasons. Um, the Chinese have a very diverse set of uh, land-based missiles that can be used to target uh, U.S. capabilities that would come close to Chinese shores. Uh, and since we have allies in the region, um, this is something that complicates our ability to defend those allies uh, and is exactly the reason why China has, has invested significantly. Uh, going back 30 or 40 years, uh, this has long been an area of, of uh, Chinese relative uh, uh, comparative advantage. Um, nuclear weapons modernization has been far more modest. I'll get to a slide a little bit later on that. Um, but, but it, too, is, is a, a somewhat modernizing but very small uh, force. The Navy side, uh, the Chinese have a range of different capabilities. The aircraft carrier has been, you know, kind of covered in the news. Um, I think more important than that are um, uh, the, the development of air defense destroyers, would, you know, analogous to our Arleigh Burks or uh, Ticonderoga class, that allow the Chinese surface action groups, the groups of small fleets, not a big carrier battle group like we would have, but three or four Chinese ships can now deploy into the blue waters, as they have done in the Gulf of Aden, uh, regularly to help with anti-piracy, but they can now deploy in Japanese waters or the South China Sea waters uh, or into the center of the Pacific. Um, similarly, another set of important capabilities are quiet diesel submarines, uh, much uh, uh, shorter range than the United States would, would maintain, but, but certainly um, uh, very capable systems in, in the geography that we're talking about. Um, finally, just flag kind of a, a new area, you know, the, the, the cyber and other cross-domain issues. How do we think about um, in this internet, uh, you know, era where I got six devices uh, on me right now that are connected to some sort of network, um, how do we think about warfare in that realm uh, when the Chinese, too, are, are very much involved in network-centric warfare? And how do we think about escalation, not in a geographic context, but in, uh, you know, into the cyberspace realm or into the outer space realm, where the U.S. remains to this day a little bit more dependent on outer space, conf uh, outer space capabilities for, um, uh, for enhancing our military capabilities? Um, if you're in China and you're looking out at where the U.S. has uh, bases, um, you might think you're a little encircled, right? And so this is important, and I show this to my students, for, for them to, remind, to, to, to be aware of that, right? We say we don't have a containment policy, uh, and yet we have uh, bases uh, or alliance-like relationships with a lot of countries uh, in, uh, on China's periphery. Uh, and so I think this kind of drives a set of uh, security concerns um, that, that are tangible in Beijing and are not something that are easy for the United States to explain away. Um, uh, you know, the, the U.S. stated policy position is that we do not intend to contain China. But if you're in Beijing looking at the development of the relationships with, our, with the South Koreans, the, the recent deployment uh, or the recent agreement to deploy by 2017 a missile defense battery uh, there, the enhancement of the relationship uh, with Japan that has uh, gone on over the last four or five years, uh, the new development of the relationship with the Philippines, where we've got an agreement to use up to five different air bases in the Philippines. Uh, and as soon as we got that agreement, we took some A-10s down and flew them over the, the Scarborough Shoals in, in the South China Sea, uh, making clear exactly what we thought we would be, those bases would be useful for. The Chinese might start to, to worry a little bit. Um, all right, I want to flag, oops, I want to flag one issue that doesn't get talked about enough um, uh, today, 
because the Taiwan uh, mainland relationship has been very positive uh, going back uh, throughout the Ma Ying-jeou administration. But with the, with the new uh, Tsai Ing-wen uh, administration from the non-KMT party, from the, the, non, the party that didn't claim to rule the mainland at the end of the Civil War uh, until they you know, kind of fled uh, across the Taiwan Strait to be defended by the Seventh Fleet. Um, instead, you've got the DPP in power, a party traditionally uh, uh, representing the 85% of the population in Taiwan who did not come over in 49, who had been pre-existing. Um, that party's now back in power. Um, uh, there, there are the beginnings of kind of uh, political pressure by the, by the mainland uh, to try to uh, obtain some concessions on what the long-term future might be from, from the DPP's perspective. Um, the reason I like this slide is not, it doesn't tell us anything about the military balance, which is lopsided in the mainland's favor in ways that we could talk about if you'd like. But it suggests to me we are likely to be stuck with this problem for a very long time. This is a question about who, who, who do you think you are? Are you, are you a, a Chinese citizen? Are you a Taiwanese citizen? Are you both? Are you neither? And if you go back to the beginning, um, the both, the purple line across the top, uh, you know, this is just in 92, so it's not the, the earliest beginning, um, but the both was, a, was the dominant uh, plurality, right? The green line, only Taiwanese, has now risen. Hardly anyone thinks of themselves as only Chinese, the blue line. I think nationalism is a really powerful force in international relations. This is the most objective measure, I think, of nationalism in Taiwan, where, you know, recognizing that you got to uh, dance carefully when you talk about the nation of Taiwan. It's not a state in the way that the U.S. recognizes it or, or uh, certainly not that the Chinese would recognize it. But this is a sense of identity that has proven very powerful and, and created a lot of conflict throughout, uh, throughout European history. Um, and, and here we have a divergence of national identity that I think uh, is likely to continue to cause problems, not just with the Tsai Ing-wen uh, administration, but going forward. Um, okay, let me talk a little bit about this nationalism. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the, the Senkaku Islands. Um, these uh, islands uh, down at the bottom of that chart, uh, you know, just at the end of the Ryukyu chain, just off of it, uh, uh, specifically, but uh, in, in an area contested by, the, by Japan and, and, uh, and China. Um, and uh, during the amplification of this crisis, kind of from 2010 through 2014, a couple of times, these islands are administered by Japan, right? That's why we call them the Senkakus, generally not the Diaoyu. Um, uh, a number of Chinese fishermen, uh, often taking off from Hong Kong uh, and then working their way up along the coast, uh, would attempt landings. Um, but this is a great picture because that middle flag is a Taiwanese flag, right? It's the ROC, the ROC, the Republic of China's flag. And so, you know, who, who is defending a Chinese nationalism here? Uh, it's very kind of contested. And so kind of talking about the media, one of the ways this picture showed up in the mainland media would to have headlines blot out the Taiwanese flag. And sometimes they just would airbrush in a, a PRC Chinese flag uh, over that. Um, this, these ide ideas of, of you know, what, is, what does it mean to be Chinese are, are, are challenging. Um, sorry, and, then, and so here's kind of the traditional Kao Tung, uh, the red line there uh, being the, the, the version of the filled in version of the nine dash line that's at the center of uh, the, the international uh, tribunal that, that just found uh, uh, some, some grave concerns with that. Um, you know, one, if you haven't seen the map, uh, it, it is a long, long ways uh, from China. But, but two, I think the other bit of context to put in here is. China is fairly behind the rest of the region in what it controlled. Um, Vietnam has uh, controlled the most um, of these features, uh, and one of the findings uh, by the tribunal was that none of them count as islands um, because they're too small to sustain uh, human uh, habitation in and of themselves. Um, and so that's important because uh, if you have an island that can sustain human habitation, you can begin to make an argument um, that uh, you deserve an 
e uh, exclusive economic zone up to 200 nautical miles away from that island. But if it's just a rock, if it's just a, a feature that's above high water or a reef or a, or a low tide elevation, a, a feature that's uh, only above water at low tide, um, then you don't get uh, all 200 nautical miles. If you go back to this map and take some of those dots in the middle of the bottom portion uh, and drew 200 nautical miles around them, well, then you'd get pretty close to the Chinese cowlick, uh, uh, cow tongue that drops down the nine dash line. Um, so one of the important findings for the, uh, for the court was that none of them, even the biggest the, that the Taiwanese actually hold, Itu Aba, um, None of them uh, constitute an island, so therefore none of them are entitled to up to 200 nautical miles uh, and, and instead only get very small 12-mile uh, circles. Um, you know, th this is an important area. The United States has, has uh, also, you know, uh, if you're following the news, um, uh, run somewhat more frequent freedom of navigation patrols. Um, by relatively large ships into the area. It's a very subtle uh, sets of, of uh, rules. You know, what are you showing by sending a ship uh, 13 miles off of one of these islands as opposed to 11 miles off of one of these islands? It goes right back to that issue of what, what territorial waters you're allowed um, uh, to, to uh, claim. Um, also, it depends what you do when you're 13 nautical miles off. Are you flying helicopters and turning on your radar, or are you just going expeditiously and directly through? So these are great questions. Somebody asked earlier, you know, good uh, opportunities for kind of critical thinking and, and debate. Because they're in the news right now, uh, because you can get, uh, you can kind of get, uh, I think, students engaged on these sorts of issues, you know, what, what is optimal U.S. policy? We don't take a stand on who owns any of these features. Um, I think that's a great thing. We don't need to be the arbiter of, of that. We do have uh, uh, demands that the countries uh, uh, permit freedom of navigation, but so this would be an opportunity to kind of uh, develop that discussion. Um, uh, as to with this, you know, the Chinese, part of the reason that they needed to build up their holdings was they were a little bit behind. And so uh, that led to the, the uh, development of, of three in particular uh, of these uh, rocks now, we can call them, rather than islands, uh, into, into things that can sustain airfields and so on. All right, um, last two points uh, here. Um, one of the other challenges is to think about how traditional great power politics uh, has evolved in this world where not the globalization of the last 150 years um, which I think is an important kind of cultural phenomenon, but the, the very deepened economic activity uh, and interchanged economic activity to the point where, you know, the iPhone says it was made in China, but boy, not a whole lot of the value added came from China. Um, these deeply integrated supply chains. What does it mean to have a uh, nation-state militarized conflict in that world? And I think that's another area where U.S. and Chinese interests are, are being pulled together in a way that, that our political system, but I think also Chinese political system, is, is struggling to kind of uh, uh, come to grips with. Last point, because I think it's really important. Um, we haven't talked a lot about nuclear weapons in the last 20 years uh, in the United States. We're beginning to have that conversation now because there's a need to recapitalize our own uh, nuclear arsenal. Um, China has some real concerns because its arsenal is relatively small um, compared to the United States, uh, and these are um, well, uh, these numbers speak for themselves. Um, but the United States, uh, sorry, but China also has on its borders Russia, uh, India, and Pakistan um, with their own sets of nuclear arsenals. And so, how does China think about sizing its nuclear arsenal? because it has territorial disputes with India, certainly, and potential concerns with Russia, how does it think about sizing its arsenal in a way that deals with American missile defense capability so that it has some deterrent capability against us, but also uh, addresses these other um, uh, uh, neighboring countries? So I think it's a, a, a diverse set of issues that are raised. Um, at the end of the presentation, uh, I've got two ways you might think about structuring a discussion on uh, kind of Chinese security issues, and then a bunch more hot links that should show up uh, through uh, the, the online version of this with some good sources, I think similar to what Victor had put up and some of them overlap. Good, good multimedia news articles as well as a couple of chapter suggestions and nice, rich uh, 
uh, uh, web pages to, to get the students to kind of d delve into. So let me shut up now. Thank you very much, Chris. Before any questions, you know, some of you were taking photographs of these slides. I want to reassure you that all of his slides, Barry's, Victor's, Jeff's, and Tom's, they are online at our website, okay? So I know that Lucille has made it a big priority to have that available. In fact, it's on now. Am I correct? If you could access it, you actually could go to it later. They will be all available to you. Questions for Chris? This is a this is a really a nice balanced review on the on the military of both sides, um, and you did start out pointing out the disparity between the U.S. spending and the Chinese spending. Um, my understanding has always been that China knows it's not going to be able to keep up, not like the USSR did, keep up with U.S. spending, so they have always been focusing on a second strike retaliatory capability as a way of keeping the U.S. at bay, and, and that way is their way of maintaining that, that balance. Do you see it the same way? So let's differentiate between uh, the nuclear and the conventional side, because you're, you're raising a really important kind of point. So on the nuclear side, the Chinese have had a very modest way of thinking about what it takes to deter other countries. The United States and the Soviet unions talked themselves into believing you needed 30,000 nuclear weapons to deter the other side. Um, the Chinese have said, you know what? It's a really bad day to lose just a handful of cities to a nuclear weapon. That's essentially unthinkable. So if we can have a handful of, of our weapons holding at risk American cities, that's going to solve the nuclear deterrence problem. Um, you know, and you can see other countries have thought along those same ways. All of these countries could do more if they wanted to. Um, so in that sense, there's, there is that. The other, on the conventional side, the Chinese have, you know, because they have relatively local interests, Taiwan, South China Sea, maybe some East China Sea sorts of things, and then North Korea, which we haven't talked about much today, um, they don't need the same set of military conventional capabilities that the United States has. Now, this is starting to change as their own global interest. They've had to evacuate their citizens from Libya and Yemen uh, over the last three or four years. Um, and so they're beginning to be pulled a little bit beyond their region, but not in the same way that the United States is. We've got 10 carrier groups, another 10 things that the Marines run that in any other Navy would be called a carrier battle group. Um, the Chinese are working on their first, and it, it isn't sort of the same capability. What the Chinese do have, though, is a set of A2AD, uh, area, Air, Air, area denial and anti-access capabilities that are primarily based on those missiles and some other land-based capabilities that could be used to really complicate the United States' ability to deploy military force into areas nearby China. And so it's been a very sort of asymmetric de development of their force. Yeah, um, so I'm thinking of this as a historian. And one characteristic that I see of, I guess, aggressive rising military powers is that they build defensive alliance coalitions. Mm -hmm. um, China's built economic coalitions in the past 15 years, but to my knowledge, and maybe I'm wrong, they haven't done much in the way of military coalitions, nor do they really have the opportunity to. Um, you know, have, am, I, am I wrong? Have they built coalitions that are you know, military in nature? And if not, does that indicate that China ultimately doesn't have an aggressive long-term posture toward the rest of the world? Right. So I, I, that's a great way of, of kind of getting into, I think, the core issue of are we in a Thucydides trap? Is there a Chinese desire to kind of challenge the international system as it exists, as laid out by the United States, um, in, in a way that, that uh, you know, leads to relatively inevitable conflict. And so one measurement of that would be military spending. Are they spending more than, you know, spending a way that shows they're dissatisfied? We've already talked about that. Your alliance point is exactly right. You characterize it correctly. They have not developed the kind of political relations. In fact, most of their political partners are moving away. You know, s countries that used to be on the fence uh, are moving away. The, the Chinese-Russian relationship is certainly a complex one. Uh, and there's weapon sales that go back and forth. But if you look at the negotiation over things like oil pipelines, the Russians are not moving radically towards the Chinese. They're being very cautious because they want to preserve uh, bargaining leverage. Um, 
So I think that's another measure of you know, a lack of a Chinese uh, long, long-term plan. And then if you look more broadly at some of the institutions, and maybe we'd have a, a good disagreement on the panel uh, on things like AIIB, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, which I would view as relatively compliant with Western norms of how one engages in international development. They, they've, they've, they've moved over time closer to AD, uh, Asian Development Bank and, and, and World Bank kind of lending standards. Not, not all the way, but so I think you know, a variety of different ways the Chinese aren't, aren't saying we need a separate set of institutions. There's certainly some evolution in the existing institutions that uh, they, they would like to see. Thank you, Chris. He and all the speakers will be around during lunch. Thank you very much.